What's going on, everybody? Eric Lindquist at Stochastic here on the Odd Chopper channel coming to with another edition of Lindy's Leans, Lex, and Locks MLB. Hit that like button, subscribe button, notification bell. It goes a long way for me on this video. It goes a long way for you. That way you become a prize whenever great content is going live here at our little neck of the YouTube woods. Going to be a good time. Going to be a good time in the MLB streets. I know a couple of random things that were happening. People were really overconfident in, in a couple of places. I don't know. People really wanted to bet Cleveland. I did not see that in any way, shape, or form. Uh, lots of weird different things that were happening in the early slate, uh, but Rafael Devers went yard. That makes me feel good. It's good to be back on track. We started the season off hot, hot, hot in the home run department. And again, it's one of those things where you miss two or three of them. If you hit a guy who's plus 400, you're making up a lot of ground. So uh, nice to have Rafael Devers on the board. Thanks for coming. I also ended up putting a very small wager there on uh, on uh, Verdugo, getting a couple of other guys, uh, Yoshida as well, um, but and Joey Gallo. Maybe he can go yard for us too. Coming up a little bit later here in Minnesota. But you guys can check out FanDuel Sportsbook. That's who we partner with. We also have a ton of offers down below for you to sign up. Uh, get exposure to different sports books. That is what Odd Shopper is about. Making sure you're always finding the best lines for whatever you're playing. Don't pay minus one ten juice when you can pay minus one hundred five. I mean. Generally, it's even more drastic than that a lot of places. So always be finding the best lines. Always be closing. Always be closing. That's an older movie. Probably not a lot of people remember. But either way, I'm ready to rock here today. 15 games on the slate. I'm going to get flying. I'm not going to do any more chit-chat here at the top. I know what you want. Let's get to the picks. Our first game, and yeah, speaking of the overconfidence, Colorado Rockies currently up 6-0 in the eighth inning. Cleveland, they're just schlacking them. It's going to probably end up 6-0. Cleveland's probably going to close this out. It just it just seems like one of those baseball games to me. But uh, yeah, it's just sometimes you just don't want to be backing bad pitchers on the other side when there's a huge price discrepancy. And it's not about what I think is going to happen, because if you ask me in retrospect, what do I think is going to happen in specific spots? A lot of the times you're going to agree with the books and say the favorite. But then you run into spots and uh, it's another one like this. We've caught Colorado with uh, Mr. Ryan Feltner on the mound going up against Peyton. Love is a batting field. <laughs> that one makes me feel good. But Ryan Feltner, he's supposedly supposed to be the ace, the future of this franchise, and or at least from a starting pitcher perspective. Not really seeing it as of right now. We did see a really nice outing against Philly. Showed what that potential can be, but I get a little bit worried about the walks. He's at least, had at least three of them in every single start this season. Seems to have decent stuff. Strikeouts five plus in three of four. But 84 pitches, running into troubles on the base pads. It would be very, uh, I wouldn't say surprising. I'm just saying that this is a contact team in the Cleveland side. There's no denying that. I'm not in love with their lineup, though. I think that that's really what it comes down to. So it's not so much Ryan Feltner that I want to be investing in, but I want to be kind of shorting this Cleveland lineup from time to time. And looking at Battenfield and some of his advanced metrics, 293 X Woba, 224 expected batting average, just a 19.5% K rate though. Uh, not going to be missing a, a lot of bats here. And I do kind of like the way that the Colorado profiles against some of his pitches. Now he's a righty, which is never good because CJ Crone, Chris Bryant, you want those guys facing lefties whenever possible. That's for sure. But this cutter seems as though he's kind of spraying it all over the place. And, this is really our first long look that we've ever had at Peyton Battlefield. Really the only look we've ever had of him. But he's an unheralded prospect, 25 years old, came out of a 2019 draft. So again, there's really no heralded prospect type nature of him. And this four seamer seems like it's spraying a little bit too. Just 153 pitches at the big league. So hard to make a ton of assumptions here. But I think negative regression is in store. Now, be on the lookout. There's rain expected for this game. Uh, yeah, I'm a weatherman too. That's what I do here. But I think I'm going to be leaning and liking Colorado plus one and a half. How do you like them apples? Yeah, Colorado plus one and a half. Run it back. It's not so much about what I think is going to happen. It's about the numbers. Minus 120 to get a run and a half seems pretty good in this spot. Half unit. Our journey takes us to Baltimore here. And yes, Rafael Devers, big fan of your work. Thank you for coming to Lindy's Leans, Likes, and Locks. Uh, not so much on the program, but he was definitely a feature part of it yesterday. Glad to get that home run across. We'll see if Joey Gallo can get it done here in the evening window as well. But uh, looking at these two pitchers on the mound, Kyle Bradish 
eh, you know, he's whatever. Corey Kluber, though, is just much, much worse. And Tyler Bradish had good stuff from time to time. We've seen it uh, just in a relief spot there early on. Then he sat out for a little while, 4-19, uh, his last pitching appearance. So pretty recently there, looked awesome. Texas, Washington, those are his two outings. Washington, he obliterated. Six innings pitched, just five hits, no earned, six Ks, lots of ground balls. But this Boston team does provide a lot better lefties than Washington. I think we can all agree on that. So you look at Verdugo, who could be competing for a batting championship this year in the AL, especially with uh, Luis Arraz now moved over to the NL. You've got Yoshida. You've got Duran Duran. You've got Tapia. They can go to Tristan Cassis, who just went yard today as well. Lots of different pieces from the left side. And Baltimore talked about this many times before as well. Plays to just a cavern out to left field. So you get a righty on the mound. You get some of these lefties there. Not the most appealing type spot to be targeting. But I will say, I'm still going to lean the Baltimore side because Corey Kluber is just not the same kind of guy that he once was. It's kind of sad when you see these players, uh, don't ever meet your heroes. Or, you know, don't ever have your heroes pitch into their 40s unless they're Max Scherzer. 46.4% hard hit percentage, 526 expected slugging. He's going to have issues, issues, issues. And uh, yeah, Baltimore, they definitely have some ammunition from both sides of the plate. Gunnar Henderson might start joining the party at some point. So far, been a pretty brutal season, but uh, Santander, both sides of it. Cedric Mullins at the top of this lineup, definitely uh, potent as well. Enough lefties that can get it done there, but Baltimore money line, just a lean, not loving laying minus 135 here on a pitcher. We've just basically seen twice here. I like the rock repertoire going forward, probably for right now, just going to be staying away. To Pittsburgh we go, and pretty wild to see. Uh, let's let's take a look at the old standing, shall we? Not something I do overly often. But Pirates, sixteen and seven, hosting the twelve and eleven Dodgers. What a time to be alive! What in the world, Pittsburgh? On a heater of all heaters, and you do not walk away from the table when you are on a heater. Johan Avito, Noah Syndergaard, and Syndergaard we've talked about many times before. You can target stolen bases against him, but the books have really, really caught on to this in a pretty prominent way over the course of the last year. I remember times where we could parlay. Oh, uh, yeah, what's she know about parlay? You could do a couple of those on DK where you could get two stolen bases of certain pieces against Zeno Syndergaard's single game parlay them. Those were really good times and really positive EV bets, even if they were long shots. And I got to say, with the stolen base rules, though, it's not like it's coming in under the radar by any means. So be on the lookout there. He's been lackluster, even though two six-inning back-to-back starts here for him against the Cubs and Mets and this Pittsburgh team, despite their record. I think we got to expect a little bit of negative regression. No, at least the books expect it. Minus 135, Los Angeles being the favorites here. And on the other side of this has been a kid who has just been awesome so far. Johan Avito talked about him being a piece from St. Louis in that trade. And uh, yeah, they ended up bringing him in, turning him into a starter. And it has been a good experiment so far with a 262 X Woba, 208 expected batting average, 24.3% K rate, velocity, lots of good things from Johan Avito. But this Dodgers lineup provides a lot of obstacles that he hasn't necessarily seen. Now, he gave up three homers in his first outing since then, has been really good in preventing power. But these lefties are a little bit different. Now, Max Muncy is on the paternity list, so be on the lookout there. But it does provide a four spot where even if you've got Mookie Betts here batting leadoff like you would expect, James Outman could be legitimately batting second or third here going forward in this kind of a situation. Now, Freddie Freeman, you would expect to be batting second. So third or fourth, may I add, uh, James Outman makes sense to be putting him up at the top of that lineup with the absence of Max Muncy if he's going to be gone for this game. And I love it. 580 expected slugging, 44% hard hit percentage, 12.4 degree average launch angle. And if you watch him hit, it is one of the prettier strokes. They got rid of Cody Bellinger. I always loved his approach, even if it was long, fluid, needed to be a little bit more compact. Watching this kid hit, he is just put together. And I don't know where he came from. These Dodgers just put together outfielders like it's their job. And then they go and buy guys like Mookie Betts, which again, that works out nicely. But I want to call out a James Outman home run. I want better than plus 350. I know we've seen a lot of dogs from him of late, but velocity going to be a helpful thing for him here in Pittsburgh. We've seen lefties go bonkers from time to time. Anthony Rizzo used to own this park when he was playing for the Cubs and they were in the division, but 
James Outman. It is absolutely going to be my home run play of the day here in this spot, so long as the value is attached to it just a lean until I can see what that number is. To Tropicana, and man, <laughs> kind of called out Taj Bradley, going to be running into some issues. Gave up two in the first inning, ended up giving up three in that outing. Still looks like Tampa Bay can put up runs with everybody. I mean, they are just, they're going to be a headache. It is what it is. They are one of, I mean, they're the best offense in baseball by far through the first couple. And if they're hitting in Tropicana, imagine when they take their talents on the road and go play in actual ballparks. My God, what a ridiculous situation. And kind of a ridiculous situation we're running into here too, because am I looking at shorting these two offenses? I might be. Luis Garcia, yes, hero of the people, had an awesome outing against Toronto. Called that one, and we needed it on Jose Barrios' day there. Jose Barrios pitched fantastic himself. We'll talk about him later in the program as well. I wanted to give him a shout-out because I pick on him enough. But Luis Garcia was the hero of that game. 8-1 win, but most of that in the eighth inning after Barrios had left. And Luis Garcia, seven innings pitch, nine Ks. The ground balls look good. The velocity was there. Very exciting to see him get back on track against an offense as potent as Toronto Gives them a little bit of hope heading here to Tropicana and facing this potent Ray squad. But Drew Rasmussen, kind of ironic because we bet him pretty heavily uh, going up against Jose Barrios in Toronto. It's amazing how these overlapping starts these days, you have a lot of the same guys showing up uh, frequently throughout this season. It'll be off by a day here. It'll get pushed back a day there. But kind of matching up this spot. And Rasmussen has been fantastic so far this season. Like, most everybody on Tampa Bay, a 23.1% hard hit percentage is make-believe, a 30.6% K rate to go with it. Now the pitch count has gone up, up, up. Nice to see him start to get extended into the 90s. He had 93 pitches in that Toronto outing, even if it went poorly, just 78 because, well, <laughs> they didn't even need to push him there in Cincinnati. They ended up playing the, uh, the bullpen game there, getting them out of a jam and my God, Tampa Bay, just equipped to handle just about anything uh, this entire season and hopefully equipped to be able to hit an under here for us. I am looking pretty fervently at the under of eight. Luis Garcia, nice to see him on track. It's a pitcher I believe in. Drew Rasmussen, a pitcher that I'm kind of surprised by because I didn't see this coming from him last season, but he has proved me wrong every single time. And then this season, we just backed him instantly because, well, a 3.04 expected ERA needs to be backed. Good stuff. Under of this one, pretty clear cut. Yeah, nothing like shorting two of the best offenses in baseball. What a time. What a world. I'm in love. I don't have a whole lot to add to this one. We have Logan Gilbert on the mound here for Seattle going up against Bailey Falter. And what happens is numbers are sometimes super, super efficient. And there's really nothing you can do about it. I don't see any play from this game. I think this total is almost exactly what I have. I think this money line is almost exactly what I have. I don't really know what to add other than Logan Gilbert. Pay attention to what those strikeout props can be. There are opportunities to short them against some of these better offenses. You get out of Seattle. It's one of the better pitchers ballparks that you could have uh, behind you. I mean, look at the transformation, not transformation. Luis Castillo was successful in great American small park with Cincinnati, just exponentially better when you add that ballpark dimension, but on the road in Philadelphia, not sure I'm in love with backing him here. I'm actually leaning towards the Philadelphia sign, even with Bailey Falter here. I will say it's no fault of Falter <laughs> that he's 0-3 here on the season. The offense is just starting to come to life. But against left-handed pitching this season, Seattle been very, very disappointing with an 81 WRC+, 26.2% K rate. think he can do just enough, but do I really want to be backing him here? I don't know even money think there's just better spots on a 15 game slate this is a better deal that's for sure bet five dollars get 150 dollars in bonus bets at FanDuel Sportsbook all you do is you go to the link below you deposit over at FanDuel Sportsbook if you do not have it yet you bet five dollars on anything and get 150 dollars in bonus bets instantly doesn't even matter if that wager wins it could lose you could get completely shelled like I don't know there's one time that I took Pittsburgh no I took Colorado against Pittsburgh earlier this season. It was like a 13-0 shelling. Made me feel like an idiot. But you know what? If I had bet $5 on it at FanDuel Sportsbook, I would have got $150 in bonus bets. I already have FanDuel Sportsbook, so that's a bummer. But take advantage of these offers. Sportsbooks, there's a ton of them down in the video description box below. Find a deal for yourself. This is the one that we're running right now here with FanDuel, but I want to keep getting you guys exposure to the best deals in the industry. Having multiple sports books to pull the best number from 
every single day. So check out FanDuel Sportsbook if you're 21 and over. And if you have a gambling problem, please call or text 1-800-522-4700. That's 1-800-GAMBLER. All righty, y'all. Back to the picks. Uh, finally, another play that we like, and we were very, very happy to see uh, Nick Lodolo. As much as I love the man, as much as I have money invested on a Cy Young proposition, I got to be honest about things, and we loved that over. It made all the sense in all the land, and it hit in like six innings. So there we go, 6-4 uh, as it stands right now in that game. Easy over, but I think we kind of want to be running it back here in this spot. Martin Perez going up against Luke Weaver, and Martin Perez is constantly constantly overperformed in a lot of ways and i'm not so much going to be going out of my way to pick on him he's not really the the highlighted fellow when it comes to this pairing on why i think it's going to be there but cincinnati it's a lefty and for whatever reason they're at least somewhat competent in terms of power in their own ballpark here against lefties now just a 73 wrc plus against them on the season martin press very good at inducing ground balls that's generally been what he's done but 10 degree average launch angle. It's starting to come up a little bit and a 276 expected batting average. The ball is getting put in play. And therefore, you play in Great American Small Park, there's always a chance that Martin Perez starts to see a little bit of neg negative regression. There's a lot of righties like Tyler Stevenson, one of the better hitting catchers in baseball. Guys who are good for their position, even if there's no like star studded situation there. Jonathan India, probably your best hitter uh, in that entire lineup. Kevin Newman hitting it with a 270 expected batting average. Also just ridiculous stuff. Going to be Nick Senzel, I would assume, probably in that lineup too. But uh, looking at the projected lineup, I'm not all that enthusiastic about it. But Luke Weaver on the other side, I think, is attackable here. He's throwing 60% fastballs. Yeah, we only have the one outing that he's had so far this season. Getting called into the action here. For Cincinnati, I thought I was going to sneeze a second ago. I didn't. But Luke Weaver, once upon a time, one of the most heralded guys coming out of the first round. He was coming up Cardinals. Then we saw him for quite a while with Arizona, St. Louis. Yeah. And then Kansas City there on the tail end, even though I don't really remember him with them last season. Cincinnati, though, they're kind of calling into anybody in duty in that, in that fourth or fifth spot in their lineup. And Luke Weaver just getting his turn. He really, really got by pretty fortunately and just... I mean, he still gave up four earned runs in that spot. Eight Ks, six innings pitched. I do not expect those kind of strikeouts to be showing up here in Texas. Has just been mauling. And I mean mauling right-handed pitching. 129 WRC+. plus. That's the second best mark in baseball with an eight, well, 811 OPS. I mean, my God. Texas. We're just going to keep backing this offense if people aren't going to be catching on, if the books are not going to be catching on to these kind of numbers. And it's even money on nine and a half. There are some, there were some nines. I just missed it. But nine and a half, the prevailing number across the industry right now, bet it. Like it. Fire it up. Good stuff. Next game, we go from an over to an over and over and over and over and over. We're like Marshawn Lynch here on this program with the White Sox visiting the Toronto Blue Jays here. And I don't really know what to make of, uh, of a couple of spots here. The, the White Sox have been probably the most disappointing team in baseball so far this season. I mean, Luis Robert, I thought, had pretty good chance at going towards the MVP. But both teams in this one get a cake puff matchup. And it is, unfortunately, my friends, not Jose Barrios Day. Oh, sad. Yeah. We're finding some we're finding some success against him still so far this season, but I think we've been luckier than good in a lot of regards. And I'm not going to be backing a team like the White Sox with this lineup with Mike Clevenger on the mound for them. Just a 17.2% K rate, 12.6% walk rate, a bullpen that is just shambles right now, which makes no sense. I thought they'd be pretty decent. And everybody expected in the AL Central that they would at the very least compete. It has not worked out that way. And Jose Barrios, it's not like I'm in love with him by any means. He had a better outing against Houston. One outing does not a pitcher make. But I think the over is going to be more of an appealing target here in this spot. I still think Jose Barrios is going to find ways to give up runs long term. I still don't believe in his stuff. I still don't believe that it was sustainable at any point in time. Now, with the Twins, tail end of that season, going over to Toronto, it was pretty easy to see a struggle in the AL Central. And now... Because teams don't have such a con uh, condensed schedule within their division, it opens it up a little bit. You got to kind of pick your spots, and I don't think this is one of them with the White Sox lineup. But the over of nine still certainly in play for me. Just a small play. Got to attack Barrios some way.
Super quick game here to cover. We have Josiah Gray on the mound against I don't know who. Now, there's a couple of options that the Mets could be falling into service. And uh, let me just pull them back up again here. Uh, there's an individual by the name of Jose Buto, who I've never seen pitch in my entire life. He did have one big out league outing where I can at least pay attention to some of his pitch mix here. He was with AAA there, but he got called up on the 16th of April. Four walks, only one earned in five innings pitched, 83 pitches there. I was probably not working that day, which is probably why uh, I don't know who this individual is and paying attention to him. But uh, I don't think that there's anything really in his mix uh, with AAA that's really all that appealing. He could be okay. I don't know. That's the only individual that I currently have on my radar that could be getting optioned and looks like they're going to be purchasing his contract at least for this start. So be paying attention to the news. I don't know what to make of it. If you want to know the play on this one, head to at Eric Lindquist on Twitter. Hit me up there or the comment section below or the best place, the premium discord. Come hang out. Use promo code Lindy when you sign up to get 50% off your first week. I'll be in there all day talking baseball, talking hoops. It's good stuff. But for the time being, obviously, Obviously, I'm going to lean the Mets money line here. I mean, some unknown going up against Washington. Sounds like a discount to, bat, uh, to back the Mets lineup. It's starting to, uh, what's the evanescence? Wake me up inside. Oh, God, that was awful. Mets money line. Please get me out of here. Back to games with lines. We like that. It's Charlie Morton and the Atlanta Braves. They're going to be hosting Brian Hoeing. And uh, Brian Hoeing got... Well, well, it was the hoedown against him. Everybody had a party. It was fun last season. An 8.64 expected ERA, a 12.08 actual ERA, just a 9.8% K rate. And yeah, we're just going to attack him right out of the get-go. He threw primarily sinkers uh, last season, 71.2% uh, 71 sinker usage here in this spot. You know who's pretty good at hitting those? Well, and it's a right-handed pitcher. Oh yeah, Matt Olson. Seems like all I do is just call out these lefties to go out and hit home runs. And for some reason, I mean, Kyle Tucker is one of my favorites. We are in very, very good standing with Rafael Devers here at the moment. Could not be happier with an individual. Joey Gallo, haven't gotten that home run alert yet. That would be great to get while we're on this program. But for the time being, Matt Olson, this is kind of the featured individual here. I really have no interest in the total here at eight and a half. I think that sits about efficient. Miami's offense, not all that appealing, even though... Charlie Morton, not really believing in the stuff, but I absolutely believe that anything better than plus 200 for Matt Olson is a play. And that's wild to say out loud because based on that projection, they would need to homer half the time to break even. That would be 80 home, 81 home runs over 162 game season. Got to remember this. Not all matchups are equal. Not all matchups are equal. So it's okay when you have a Mike Trout going at plus 220 or something of that nature to be able to back them if the spot is successful. So overall, pretty easy for me to look at Matt Olson to home run as the lean here. Not really going to be a lot of numbers that I'm going to be opposed to betting against Brian Hoeing based on his horrendous numbers in 2022. Off to Milwaukee for a game that isn't all that appealing to me. Eric Lauer on the mound for Milwaukee. You got Spencer Turnbull on the mound for Detroit, and Turnbull is just... He's not turning the clock back. He's terrible. He's always been bad. 15.3% K rate, 10.6% walk rate. I suppose Detroit has to put somebody on the mound every day. I think that's like part of being a major league baseball team, but it seems like they don't have that concept down. Based on some of these starters, it has been the bleak midwinter, that's for sure. But Eric Lauer on the other side, also pretty bleak. Last year, the K rate was super spiked in the first half of the season. People caught on. The book came out on him at a 496 expected slugging. Now this year, just a 20.4% K rate. Zoic Scoob, that's not very good. However, of course, I'm going to lean minus one and a half here going up against this Detroit team. And yesterday was plus one and a half on the Detroit side as the lean. Wasn't all that in love with it. Didn't end up making the card. This also is not going to be making the card here tomorrow. I don't really find anything in this game all that appealing. Everything looks pretty efficient. But backing Eric Lauer at minus 66, I get this Detroit lineup. I mean, they ended up, Nick Matten found a three-run shot there to, to kind of bust it open there at the beginning of the game, 3 nothing for Detroit. And that's the kind of thing where I want to be finding spots that are more projectable on my end. This one feels like a little bit of a wild, wild west situation. But Milwaukee minus one and a half would be your lead. Five games to go. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. Welcome to Odd Shopper. To all you newbies and to all you people 
who haven't been here recently, you know it's Joe Ryan Day here on the Minnesota Twins. Love it. And Nestor Cortez. feel like we've had this matchup before. Because we did. We took an under. It ended up working out. It was fantastic. And I do get a little bit worried with Joe Ryan facing the Yankees here in Minnesota. 50.8% hard hit percentage. Also a decent, at least neutral, hitting stadium here in Minnesota at Target Field. It's not Yankee Stadium by any means, although that's basically just home runs. And we'll have a conversation about Yankee Stadium when we get back around there about doubles and things of that nature at Yankee Stadium. A little bit suppressed. You gotta have the power. I got the power. But either way, looking at the Yankee side of it, Nestor Cortez has been phenomenal. Uh, Rugula, 272 x Wobo, 199 expected batting average. Case, never going to really be there in a prominent way with him. 23.7% K rate this season. A little bit down from 26.5%, 27.5% he had the previous two seasons. But I expect it kind of sit in that range. And that's good enough for me because he does everything else well. One of the better locators of just pure peppering fastballs in all of baseball. Fastball, cutter, it is incredible to watch him just kind of work around the plate and do a lot of really, really good work. And as much as Minnesota's lineup with Kepler back healthy, with Gallo back healthy, there are some pieces there. They're both from the left side. So you're going to be relying on Carlos Correa. You're going to be relying on Byron Buxton, who's actually better against righties, which is kind of weird. Jose Miranda. Yeah, this game. It's going to project a really nice front under. Yeah. But it has to just be a lean because it's at seven. Seven is the number that we already have sitting here. Pretty wild stuff to see a seven hung up here at Target Field. You don't see a lot of them, but with the caliber of pitchers we have here, even with the quality of that Yankees lineup and decent pieces at the top of the Minnesota lineup, Buxton, I love you. Uh, Joey Gallo, love you too. But under seven, still think it's the right way to go if you're going to do anything here. Just haven't pulled the trigger. There's other spots that I prefer on today's slate. We got the Cubbies here. Cubbies. Going to Wrigley, going to be hosting San Diego, St. Diego, which means Wales, we're not going to say it, although we all know the line. And I've said worse things in my life. We all have. It's a weird segue into Blake Snell. Yes, Blake Snell on the mound here for San Diego, going up against Justin Steele. And both of these Southpaws have had very, very different seasons. And I think we said this early on when we targeted Blake Snell in that very first outing against Colorado. I saw him pitch in spring ball. It was not pretty. Went to Arizona, front row seats, watched a triple-A Seattle team carve him up. Yeah, like legitimately no starters. Like Haggerty and all those dudes just carving up Blake Snell. They had to pull him out, and then they allow him in spring ball to come back in in the second inning. And since then, it's just been us targeting Blake Snell. Worked out pretty well. 395 x Woba. 534 expected slugging. He does have a 24.4% K rate, which is above normal, but that is way lower than we've had in seasons past for Blake Snell. He is getting behind in counts yet again, constantly. Every single outing, it would seem. It, it's like a it's like a plague for this dude. I don't understand what's going on. Could he turn it on any given time? Yeah. Has he still not given up more than four earned in a single outing? Yeah. But he's also hasn't pitched outside of the fifth inning once. Yes not reach the sixth inning one time. So that's going to suppress some of your earned runs. Still has an ERA of six, is still 0-3 on the season, has a 1.89 whip, which is just awful for somebody who has the name recognition of a Blake Snell. So we are going to target him against the Cubbies because this Cubbies lineup is just no joke right now. I love what we're seeing out of them. Shout out to a 121 WRC plus Patrick Wisdom up near the top of homers there in the NL. Just ridiculous stuff. Ridiculous power up and down the lineup. So many improvements with Dan Zubi Swanson. Ian Happ starting to come to the party in a very prominent way and Justin Steele on the mound. I get it's a very difficult matchup and now Tatis back in the lineup there for the Padres but I... Do not care. He's got a 25.8% hard hit percentage. A 332 expected slugging does Justin Steele. 25.3% K rate, which is extended past that of Blake Snell in the early going of this season. I get the home dog right here. That is just Lock Central, friends. Yes, Lock Central, Chicago Cubs. I get it, San Diego. They'll probably put on the afterburners here sooner rather than later with all of the massive, massive power they have here. But Xander Bogarts, 
He's leading the league in WRC Plus against righties. Yes, he's been bashing righties. This is a lefty coming to the mound here. I think this is going to be something that we can still target here going forward with Justin Steele. There's some pieces here that don't make sense entirely here. You get to take Carpenter off the off the field. You get to take a lot of these left-on-left -left matchups off the field, but Jake Cronenworth will probably stay in there, uh, or Kim probably will stay in there too. But Justin Steele, what a spot. Minus 105, my favorite play on the board for Tuesday's slate. But my second favorite play on the board comes up next too, so hey, we're not going to besmirch it too much. We got Griffin Canning on the mound here for the Halos. We have Mason Miller on the on the mound here as well for the Oakland Athletics. And it's not so much Mason Miller that I'm going out of my way to pick on. He looked pretty decent in that first outing. A 3.92 expected ERA, 27.8% uh, carry. I mean, that doesn't really matter. It's one outing. So you can just disregard that. But this bullpen is averaging over eight. Eight earned runs. What are we doing here right now? They have been out of control bad. Yes, Oakland A's on the whole as a pitching staff giving up over eight runs per game this season. That is almost two full runs above second. Like, we're talking as bad of pitching as it possibly gets. So Mason Miller, if he's short for this game, well, then you get to just party time. P-A-R-T-Y, because Otani's gotta. That's going to be what he does. And I look at Griffin Canning here, first outing that we got from him as well. I'd say it's a little bit inspiring, considering it was a very tough spot against New York. Well, actually, a second outing it was, but uh, Washington in that first outing, five er five innings, 69 pitches, didn't know what to expect against the Yankees, but really good stuff in 100 pitches. 100 pitches, what are we doing here? I don't know. Velocity looked good. They really liked what they saw with him. Felt like he could extend those pitches. It's kind of all systems go, and against righties, Oakland's been still pretty terrible in 86 WRC+. plus. They've been above average against lefties, Brought that up against Jose Suarez today. Why I didn't try to go nuts with that one. Yeah, I think we're just going to be targeting this one too. Minus one and a half. feel like the Angels are always on the card. They weren't on the card today and it actually felt really, really good. But minus one and a half. Los Angeles, lock button, second favorite play on the board for Tuesday. Those are your two locks back to back. Who knew? We're going to go out with a whimper these last two. We have Kansas City and Arizona on the mound. Brian Singer going up against Ryan Nelson and... Neither one of these guys are all that appealing. Brady Singer is really bad. 642 expected slugging, 431 ex woba These are some of the worst marks in baseball. Sub 21% K rate. I mean, he's just awful. And Ryan Nelson, I'm not all that inspired by anything that he does. Primarily fastball pitcher. Throws that over 50% of the time. Been limiting hard contact, which is good. You do get MJ Melendez, who's not in the lineup. Was correct about that assumption. Arizona money line. Let's go. Let's go, Arizona money line tonight. They haven't started yet. I should go watch that here in a second. But there is nothing, nothing that I really want to do with this game. Arizona money line looks like the spot. Do I want to have Ryan Nelson at minus 132? No. No, I do not. So don't bet it. But that's the top projected one from this game. 9.5. Perfect. Run total. Everything else efficient. Actually, everything's efficient here. Don't bet it. And the last game of the night, we're heading to St. Louis. I'm assuming it's going to be Sean Manaya on the mound, but we have no line. Again, going out with a whimper here. Uh, one guy that we do know is going to be Jake Woodford on the mound, and he is just terrible. He's got a 60.3% hard hit percentage. Blech. 595 expected slugging. 13.6% K rate. Blech. It's a lot of throw up. It's really bad stuff. Would rather have a Woodford reserve than a Jake Woodford on my team any day of the week, but not every day because that would be alcoholism that would be bad don't do that eric although i could really use a whiskey right about now we'll wind the day down sean benaya is who i expect here but the books they're going to be waiting on that news i'll just break down sean benaya quick he's been awful so far this season he's a lefty so you're going to be able to target st louis with all of their you know righty power against sean benaya you could look at goldschmidt arenado suppressed home run numbers that you're going to get in san francisco better ballpark for lefties especially post some of these changes there. One of the best ballparks for triples. Fun fact. I really don't know what to add to this game. Let's get out of here. I'm going to be leaning towards the St. Louis side because I just don't like Mania and I don't like Jake Woodford either. Target some lefty power there. That would be great stuff. So let's just leave. We're done. Good day, sir. I said good day.
And that does it for another edition of Lindy's Leans, Likes, and Locks. You know what to do. Oh, that was my dog who wanted to say hi to everybody. Say hi to Duke. Oh, big yawn from a sweet boy. Let's get ourselves out of here. Let's go on a walk, Dukey. Maybe go find a Woodford Reserve. That's okay by me. Check out FanDuel Sportsbook on the way out. Sign up in that video description box below. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go be a doggy dad. Let's get out of here. I'll be back on Wednesday, per usual, breaking down all the baseball, all the time, just for you guys here on the Odd Chopper channel. Until then, I'm Eric Lindquist. Best of luck in the MLB streets on Tuesday. Thank you.